Morning, church. How you guys doing? You good? It's good to be in it. Good to know that, by the way, this church, as much as the River Church, is the church of Jesus. It belongs to him. He's the head of it. He loves it. He died for it. Man, he lives for it. Are you glad about that today? Yes, it's his church. It's incredible. Your pastor, you may think, is, uh, is taking some time off. He's actually preaching in Delaware. Time off for him is like more preaching somewhere else. So, but he loves you and has entrusted the services uh, with us this weekend, the young guys. So the young guns, you know, sometimes we can do a good job. And he's like, don't burn the church down, guys. So <laughs> hope to with their preaching, but not like literally, you know. So, But have you ever watched something or you've seen something that's just so inspiring that it begins to lift your soul to levels you can never think it could go? And it changes your heart and it encourages you. And I, I saw a little just clip of a, a, a guy that had so many things going against him. And I don't know what's going against you this morning and things you're battling with, things you may be struggling with and things you feel that are just pressing you down, maybe in your marriage, maybe at home, maybe in finances, maybe with depression, so many things that try to come against us, you know, and it's good to know, by the way, that Jesus says that there's no weapon formed against you that can stand against you when Jesus is on your side, by the way, but I want to show you just this quick clip to enter our message today of asking a question that you probably see clearly on my shirt. Do you got Jesus? Ain't the best grammar, but if you don't got Jesus, you don't got anything. But when you got Jesus, let me help you, you got everything. Do you believe that? I believe it, and I believe that this man you're about to see will inspire your heart because you'll see something so unique about him that he has Jesus. So, fellas, let's show him the clip real quick. We're standing up for Nick. Now, this is what's so unbelievable. As you've heard, people complain about the spots on their face and people complain about not having a boyfriend and not being able to have the mates of their life. What happened to you that you were able to take all of you, take your chemistry, being born with no arms and no legs, take your connections, your relationships, your life circumstances, mm -hmm. your state of consciousness, and then choose, make the conscious choice yeah. that you were going to take all of that which the rest of the world looks at, you know, undeniably as a pretty bad hand, and that you were going to turn it into something, you were going to be exalted by it. What, what happened to you that you were able to do that? Oprah, I know that you love to think out of the box and have things outside of the box in your yeah. show. Yeah. And I know that you love illustration, so if I may illustrate in about 180 seconds, can I do something a little crazy, but it'll Certainly. be powerful? Go Is that right cool? Ahead. You got a camera behind me, right? Yeah. I'm going to show you. Come, come, come. This step right here. Is there enough light here? Okay. The chemistry. I was born without arms and legs. The chemistry I could not change. In my life, I know that God didn't give me this pain but what the enemy tried to use for bad, he turned into good. Yeah. Okay. Man, the connections. I want to tell uh, Porsche, uh, look, I'm a guy, I love cars, okay? And I love Porsches more than Ferraris, okay? <laughs> and, and I want everyone to know that, that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. And until you can actually understand that we are all wonderfully and faithfully made from God, um, I want you to know that, that you will always be trapped and chained and you will be stopped. But when you have the incredible power of faith in action, nothing holds you back. And you're beautiful just the way that you are. No worries. For me, I felt the connection. Yeah. For me, in my life, I'm thinking, man, I'm not going to get married. I can't, you know, can't even hold my wife's hand. What connection am I going to have? But you know what? All things come together for the good for those who love him. Man, this is a little bit high. I'm going to break my arm, man. This is pretty crazy. All right. I'm going to break my arm. I'm going to break my arm. Circumstances. Being born without arms and legs, man, it's all about choice. You asked me what it was. I had parents who were my heroes. They always said, you, you can either be angry for what you don't have or be thankful for what you do have. Do your best and God will do the rest. And then consciousness. Because I gave my life to Lord Jesus Christ Hallelujah. and the renewing of my mind, Hallelujah. Wow. I knew that I could be unstoppable. Amazing. 
Isn't that incredible? Incredible to think. I don't know what is coming against you today or what you feel like you have against you, but can I tell you the way that he just showed you that when Jesus is on your side, it doesn't matter what forms against you, what comes against you, that when God is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. Man, when God is for us, who could ever be against us? It's incredible to think about Jesus, to think about who he is and what he's done and who he is in our life now. Because, man, sin had separated us from God, who we needed to have a relationship with, right? But we need Jesus in our life so badly. In the Gospel of John, it's so incredible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they kind of give like a, a record of, you know, what happened in Jesus' life, the birth of Christ, and, you know, just going on this event and that event. And they do a great job at it. But John, John reminds me, if you would, and forgive me in this, theology experts, but kind of like a hippie disciple, if you would. He was like, loved Jesus. And Jesus said he was the one that he loved too and that he just cared for him so much. And John wanted people to know, and he was excited about it, that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was our hope. He was our, man, he was our new life. He was going to forgive us of our sins. And he wanted people to know that. And he began to show this in such an incredible way as he called him the Word. Because the Bible says in the beginning of time, there was the Word, and that was Jesus. And the Word was with God. And not only was it with God, the Word was God. John wanted to make it crystal clear that Jesus was God. And if you want to know God and you want a relationship with Him, you've got to know Jesus. And when it goes on, he says that he also, man, he was the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Oh, how beautiful. And that also that he had met with a man named Nicodemus in the middle of the night. Isn't it good to know that no matter how late it is and how bad your struggles are, that Jesus was there to answer your prayer, by the way. Amen is right. And the Samaritan woman, man, a woman at the well who was ashamed and upset and difficulties in her life. Going to the well, you ever wonder why in the middle of the day, not in the morning when it would have been most full or in the evening when it would have been most full. Middle of the day to avoid the crowds, but Jesus sought her out. Is it good to know that Jesus seeks you out, by the way? And he told her everything that she had done. Here's my sin, Jesus, right in front of me. Here's everything I my God, and he says, you can drink of me and thirst no more. And she runs back to the town. One of the first incredible like evangelists that we have, she runs back into the town. She tells everybody, Jesus, I met him, and he showed me everything that I had done. And I can imagine the ladies down, Woo, honey, I wouldn't be telling them everything that you had done. And she said, no, it doesn't matter because my guilt is gone and my shame is gone and my sin has been taken away. And don't you see? And the whole town exploded. And this is like, you see a picture of what should happen when Jesus, who is, by the way, this is his church. He's the head of this church, and he lives for it. He died for it. Man, he breathes life into it. Do you believe that today? It is. And like the man with no arms and no legs, that what inspired him and what moves him? And he said, even though the enemy means something for bad in your life today, can I tell you, God, who overcame the enemy on the cross, means something for good in your life today. Is that worth celebrating today or what, man? Jesus is for you in this place today. My heart and my prayer is that you become re-energized. Man, you put your focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And he that has started a good work in your life is faithful. Do you believe that? Amen. Faithful and able and capable to complete it. Man, don't put your faith on anything else. Don't put your eyes to the left or to the right, right? Remember Peter on the water walking. He's walking and he begins to take his eyes off who? Jesus. And as he does, he begins to sink. And all of a sudden, he's down, and he is caught, and it is like the end game for him. And he looks up, and who stands there for a second chance for him? Jesus, reaching down, picking him up, and saying, come to me. Let me pull you into me. I'll take care of you. Man, we serve a God that can walk on water. We serve a God that takes a man with no arms and no legs and, man, inspires him. That man preaches to millions of people. God has taken what the enemy wanted to destroy him, discourage him. You'll never be married. You'll never make much of anything. You'll be in an assisted living home forever. God's never going to use you. God says, no, 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 forget that. Forget what the enemy says. Forget him pushing against you. God says, I'm going to put you on a big network like Oprah so millions of people can hear my name, the name of my son, Jesus Christ, praised, lifted high, exalted, right? Put where he belongs. God did that. God can take situations and flip them upside down. Do you believe that? Yes. God can take what's meant for evil and turn it into good. Only God can do that. And he is so incredible. And John's heart is to share this as he shows Jesus seeing multitudes of people, the feeding of the 5,000. What's so unique about the story is not only their spiritual health, like we come to church to be nourished with God's word and to encourage us and remind us to put our focus on Christ, but 
also that Jesus, man, God had compassion. He says, they're hungry. Let's get them some food. Can you imagine the disciples were like, there ain't no Taco Bell nearby. We can't go do that. And we had, we had 70 middle schoolers with us this weekend, and we had to feed them, and we've tried everything, and pizza and Taco Bell is always the cheapest. <laughs> and so we feed them pizza. Hey, we can order 30 or 40 pizzas or 250 tacos, and it's what we do. But can you imagine 5,000? 5,000? Jesus, how are we going to do this? And he begins to do a miracle right before them. Or the official son, the government official that comes to him, and, man, he wasn't supposed to communicate with Jesus, and he wasn't supposed to be part of that. And so many people in the world are like, I don't want religion, but this guy knew it's not religion. There's something different about Jesus. Do you believe that? Yeah. There's something unique and different about him and life-giving. And, man, i, I got to find him, this government official that shouldn't have talked to him and shouldn't have been next to him. They, he comes in and he says, my son is sick and I, there's no hope but you. I, I hear your hope. I hear you can provide healing. I hear you can do this. And so I'm putting everything i got inside of you right now. And Jesus says, go. Your son will be healed. He speaks. I mean, he says a word and it comes to an existence. The, the government official goes on, by the way, wouldn't it be incredible if our government and all the officials turned to Jesus? Yeah. That would help turn a nation around, wouldn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't it be incredible? And the government official goes back home. He goes home and he says, my son, how is it? Can you imagine? I love my boys. How is my son? Is he okay? Is he, is he well? And they said, he's been well for over a few hours now. And the man said, when was he well? And they said, the seventh hour. The seventh hour. He said, that's exactly when I spoke to Jesus. Isn't it good to know that he's at work in our life? The wedding. He shows up at a wedding. They run out of wine. Jesus takes water and he turns it into, who is this guy that can do these things? Jesus. He came and he washed his disciples' feet. God, don't forget who he is. John's like, doesn't want you to forget. This is God. Holy God, powerful God, hold the stars in the sky by the billions, God, hold our galaxy together, travel at the speed of light, and never get through the universe, God, that God, right, in the form of man, on one knee, washing his disciples' feet, cleaning them, because he came to serve and not be served. Do you know that? Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because sometimes we forget who Jesus is. Man, we forget, the Bible says that if you want to really know God, and we do, who doesn't? We want to know God, know the Father, Jesus says, and know me. If you want to know what God's like, and you want to experience God's love, and you want to see God in action, Jesus says, look at me. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh, is this incredible, or what? you just like, Jesus, you're so incredible. And he does all these things, and even his disciples, after he died on the cross, and man, he rose again, and Man, the disciples, you know what happened to them? They left. They were afraid. And let's not make fun of them. Have we ever been afraid and fallen far from God? And we find ourselves in a spot where we need God. They went back to what they used to do, right? And they go back to fishing and this and that. And how many have ever fallen back and we're trying so hard and we're trying so hard to do right and we're trying to quit this addiction or quit this or make our marriage work or, or help just kind of pull things together and we try with all of our might and soul, don't we? And we, we fail and sometimes we just we say, well, forget it and what has happened? We take our eyes off Christ. Jesus shows up. The men see walking from a distance. Who is this? Could it be? They dare not say it. Could it be? Yes, it is Jesus. And he comes to him and he says, wait, fellas, man, we got a mission. We're going to change the world forever with love. We're going to overcome evil with good from the cross. Do you see this? Man, hope begins to arise. I don't care if you're on your second, your third, your fourth, your 90th chance. Jesus is there and his arms are spread wide. And he's saying, come to me, all who are heavy laden with burdens, and I will give you rest. I will give you strength. I will re-energize you. Oh, do you see who this is? The head of his church, a redeemed, called out body of believers. Not a building, but you and I, people that miss the mark. We've fallen short, but Jesus says, I've stepped in the gap and I'm gonna do something great in your life. Isn't it incredible of what Jesus has done in our life? Do you see this today? He is incredible. He is more than the cornerstone of our foundation of our life. Man, the Bible says that all things come from him. And they go back through him. Anything you do, the, the fact that you're breathing today. And then we glorify God back to him. Everything. I'm a little excited. That's just my opening. By the way, 
I've been excited. We're trying to put together my little boy's report, and uh, he's doing a report on beetles. Did you know there are 300,000 different types of beetles, by the way? <laughs> we learned that, didn't we, Caleb? And, and even they have a book of A through Z, all the beetles. There's the African beetle, Bombardia beetle. There's the cucumber beetle. And then, I forgot D, buddy. I don't even know. So it just goes on and on. But I was so excited. I'm like, come on, Caleb, you can do this. And he looked over, and he's like, Dad, I'm writing this report, not you. <laughs> he's 70. He's bossy, but he's seven, and he told me that, and I, I was like, why am I, why am I so excited and pumped up? Because I have a chance to preach Jesus. Jesus' church should be excited to preach Jesus, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Shouldn't we? When, when we come here together, man, we put our focus and our eyes and our heart on Jesus, and we get re-energized with his word, which is alive and acting. It instructs us. It teaches us. It guides us. It, it forms us. It gives us all these incredible things from his word, because the word, the Bible says, according to John, was from the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was who? Jesus. So when we read even through the pages, don't forget your reading of Jesus, His Word, and His love, and His compassion in your life. You say, man, I know, but I'm, I need to do right, Jeremiah, and i got to do better, and i got to fix my marriage. You can't. You could never do better. It was why Christ came. You can't fix your marriage apart from Christ. Jesus says you can do nothing apart from Him, but with Him, all things are possible according to his will for your life. Doesn't that just excite you and make your heart jump right out of your shirt, doesn't it? Because it's just so incredible what Jesus wants to do in our life. And when a church begins, his church, by the way, begins to realize this and take notice of this, man, watch it explode. Watch there not be enough buildings to hold it. John says this too, of all the things that Jesus did in his ministry, that they couldn't write them down. They couldn't even gather them. That they'd have to have like thousands of libraries. He's probably an exaggerator like I was a little bit, but thousands of books. And to write this down, they couldn't contain, couldn't hold the lives that were impacted, the lives that were changed, the sins that were forgiven, things that were apart, put back together. Do you see this? All because of one man, Jesus. And he's more than a good man in history. He's more than just a person that just like, oh, he was a great guy. No, no, no. He is our hope. He is our salvation. David calls him the rock in a fortress, in a shelter, in a shield. Do you see this? He is all these things wrapped into one. He is the hope and the salvation of the world. Do you believe that today? This is what we should chant. This should be the anthem of our hearts, church, that we shout Jesus. Why? Because he's forgiven us. He loves us. He holds us in his right hand. He is so powerful, and he's so for us and not against us. And John is saying all these things about him. He's so just in love with Jesus because he gets it. For so long, we've been separated from God, and we've tried so hard, God. We've tried to do right. We've tried to fill this law. We've tried to do this, and we, Israel, over and over, you see in the Old Testament, they give up. We try, and we give up, and they get in bondage and slavery. They try and they give up and they give them bond. And sometimes we'll dog Israel and we'll get on them. Come on, what about in your own life and my life? How many times have you tried and missed the mark? And you try and you miss the mark and you feel like just sometimes giving up, huh? And people will say things like churches are closing all over in a staggering rate in America. Do you know that? That breaks my heart because people need to be able to come into a place and receive hope, don't you think? And receive Jesus. And they don't. They get more condemnation sometimes from, of all people, us. And it shouldn't be that way. We should be putting Jesus on a pedestal, putting him at the center of his church. It's his church. I mean, it's his house. It's like having dinner here every Sunday afternoon. We don't even invite him. He's a guest of honor. He's the one that needs to be in the center of it. Do you see? In the center of your life, he's holding all things together. And John takes us to a place, if I could this morning for just a few minutes, to encourage us, to ignite our hearts, to take a man with no arms and no legs that Jesus can give a world platform for. What could he do with you? Do you have both arms and both legs today? You, can you run for Jesus? Can you preach Jesus? Can you shine Jesus? Can you be used by him? Yeah, you know why? Because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God called you out with a purpose, every single one of you, that from your nose to your toes and everything about you, that God was with you in the darkness of the womb before anybody knew you, before mom laid eyes on you. God was believing in you and dreaming for you. Do you know that? And as Brandon was reading that scripture, his thoughts are precious toward you. And more than the grains of the sand on the beaches of the world, God thinks great things about you. Think about this. God holding the stars in the sky. God holding everything together. God that speaks and things come into existence. This God is on our side. Isn't that good to know? I mean, come on. This is incredible. And John takes us to a place. And he says, you know what God is about more than anything? 
Does he need glory? Yes. Does he have to expel sin? Yeah, there, there's nobody that hates sin more than God. But let me tell you something else about him. There is nobody that loves this sinner more than God. And because he loves us, he's unwilling to let us just sit there and flounder and be hurt. He wants to take us and redeem us and renew us and make all things new, the Bible says. And John says, let me take you to a place of all these different people, the Samaritan woman, Nicodemus, the government official. And he takes us to deal with people. Aren't you glad that God is focusing in on us today? By the way, he's concerned about us and where we are, wanting to change us and mold us and make us into something incredible. And thank you, God, for doing that. I begin to read in here a little bit, and you can follow on the board. It starts here in John chapter 8. Stories of a woman caught in adultery and some theologians would say, as you read through here, they don't know if the story should be in here. It was in some of the manuscripts, some wasn't. And I don't pretend to be a theologian. I don't. I just read the notes and study up on it a little bit and try to understand it the best I can like you do. And, but I believe that, do you think anything's in here by mistake? No, I don't either. I think that God wanted us to see this story today. I do in my heart. I believe that God wanted to use John to point out what God was all about. People. Not to come in to condemn the world, but to do what? Save it. Save the world. Because he loved it. He loves his church. You know what that means? He loves you. You are his church. Not this building. He don't love this building. He loves you. Every one of you. And so it opens up. It says, they went each to their own house. Everybody went home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Isn't it good to know that when everybody falls asleep, God's up thinking about you, by the way, praying for you. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. Isn't it good to know by this? He's the last person to leave the job site that is a job site of your life, that he's at work in your life. Ephesians says that he's your workmanship. He's doing a work in your life. And he's the first one there in the morning. Do you know that? Before you rise, God is there thinking of you. And it says, all the people came to him. Why shouldn't they? He had all the hope to offer them. And he sat down and taught them. He sits with great authority. And he teaches from his word. His word is alive and active. I challenge you this week just to open his word and say, I don't understand the Bible completely. Just read a few verses and say, God, speak to me. I need you, right? You're the every bread of life that I need you. I, this is what I need to survive. And Man, but look what happens. This incredible picture opens up. Jesus comes into town and people flock around and they want to hear about him. They want to hear his hope and they, they need him. Every one of us, every man and woman, if grandparent and grandson or grandchild, grand, every person in this building today needs Jesus, right? And so here we are, we're sitting around, we're hearing from his word. We want him to walk in the midst of his church. We want to hear from him. And then what happens? So often when God sees you, do you know what he sees? Potential. I believe it all my heart. Taking 70 middle schoolers this weekend, we brought him here last night at the service, and man, you take 70 middle schoolers into a hotel and watch out. Hotel management loves you. <laughs> and then you bring them to the pool all at one time that says maximum capacity, 30, something like that. And they say, can we get this many kids? I'm like, yeah, I think it said 80. I don't know. And I put my leaders in there and the kids in there, and I remember walking back in there, and everybody was like, this lady and family walked out, and they're like, I can't believe all these kids. And I'm like, I know it. What is this? <laughs> Whose group is this? And I walked right by the door, I'm not going to lie. I had a cowardly moment. I'm like, my buddy Andy's like, dude, get in here. And I'm like, wait till this family leaves. They are ticked off. <laughs> but it was 70 young men and women full of potential. The next generation that needs to know that God loves them. That they can turn a switch on full of light, full of Jesus in their life. That they can shine to a generation, right? That they can begin to turn our culture and our generation around from the divorce rate being at 60 or 70% down to zero. How about that? Huh? About, how about like some of our kids growing up knowing that God loves them, God's got a plan for them, and giving them the ability with God, they can be a great father, a great mother. They can do great things, and we taught them, and we preach that, and we pray that over them all weekend because they're the next generation. They're your next generation that represents, that'll carry on the church, that'll be the preacher, be the teachers, be the parking lot attendants, that'll go take Christ to the world. And I want them to know more than anything, let Jesus be your foundation. When Jesus is for you, nothing can come against you. You see this? And so here is this spot where everybody's being taught, but the enemy, when he sees you, then he wants to come against you. He wants to accuse you. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He tries to remind you that, no, no, you're no good. He tries to remind you of things that aren't true. He says, you're never going to work through this depression. Come on now. He tries to remind you of things that your marriage is not going to ever represent this Jesus in the church or this perfect thing off like The Bachelor or something. You know, it's, it's not going to be that. 
And by the way, has anybody even had a successful marriage off The Bachelor? <laughs> I'm kidding, ladies. Don't get mad at me. So <laughs> my wife likes that show. And yes, once in a while, I'll watch it with her. Okay, I feel like confessing my soul up here. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what am I doing? I feel a spirit of honesty up here, I guess. So, <laughs> Jeez. Are we supposed to have this much fun in church? Okay. So, but the enemy is trying to remind in a serious way that your kid's never going to straighten up. Trying to remind you, you're not going to be able to parent the way you want to parent. Trying to remind our young people, you're not going to grow up and be successful. That what your dad and mom maybe say to you in the heat of the moment is true, that you're no good or you just keep messing up. He begins to whisper in the ears, doesn't he? He begins to try to hold you back and tear you down. Do you know why? Because he sees potential in you. He sees all that God has put inside of you. And I want to show you what happens. John wants to show us that in our lives, we see this woman caught in adultery, that people coming against her, Jesus stepping in the middle of it and sending her off with new hope and a new path. So let's read through. Verses 3 through 6. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees, those that knew the law, all this kind of stuff, said the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Jewish law said they had to catch people in the act. They had to see you stealing something, see you doing something, see you saying something. So they, they, they break into this home and they grab this lady and they bring her in. And verse 4 says, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery, now in the law. By the way, the Bible says that Moses brought in the law. But Jesus brings in grace and truth. Aren't you glad, by the way? The law we can't keep, Jesus says grace will abound above it. Jesus says, I'm perfect. I'll keep the law. I'll do it in your place. Put your sin on top of me, my righteousness on top of you, and I'm going to make all things good once again. I'm going to put you in good standing with the eternal Father. Are you glad today for that, by the way? And so even though it's going on, it says, now in the law, and these men are trying to Take the law, which is the ministry of condemnation, trying to come against us. Is the law bad? No, Jesus created it, right? God created it, but, but knew we couldn't keep it. And so God's like, I'm going to fulfill it. And so here it says, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone this woman. So what do you say? Verse 5, or 6, excuse me. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against them. Referring to Jesus, they don't even care about the woman they're trying to hurt. The enemy doesn't even so much as care about hurting you. He cares about defaming Jesus. He wants to try to knock Jesus off his path. He wants to, once again, like he did in the Garden of Eden, say, the Bible says one man sin came into the world, Adam. Through one man sin can be taken out of the world, Jesus. And the enemy hates that and wants to destroy that. But the Bible says there's no weapon formed against us that can stop this, right? Jesus says even the gates of hell will try to stop his church from being built. And does he say, is that possible? No way, not a chance. And then we see it right here. John's unveiling. This is going on in her life. It goes on in our life. It tries to come against the church. It's trying to do it to the culture. And I want to show you, it gets so exciting about what Jesus is about to do. It says, Jesus bent down and wrote something on his finger on the ground. Who knows what he was writing? Theologians have speculated and guessed for a long time. People far smarter than I am. But maybe he bent down for a moment and he began to write down their sin. Say, so you want to hold the law against this woman? What about your sin? What about this? Who knows what he was writing there, but here's what I know. Man, we accuse people all the time of stuff. And we'll be accusing people of this and accusing people of that and left and right. I, I'll do it all the time at home sometimes. I'll say, Maria, there's no food in the fridge. I'll, I'll do this too. I'm like, babe, there's no food in the fridge. And I'll close the door like that. And she's like, did you look? I'm like, no, you know. And I'll, sometimes I'll go, where's my deodorant? Like she's trying to steal my right guard deodorant. <laughs> Where's my deodorant? You moved it. You moved my deodorant. Did you use my deodorant? And Maria's like, Jeremiah, I didn't use your deodorant, number one, and I didn't move it. I'm like, I don't see it anywhere. I don't see it anywhere, babe, and I'm yelling out the door doing this, not looking in the cabinet, by the way. Fellas, you know you do that. So just get honest. And finally, I'll, she goes, take a good look, and I'll look in. It's on the left side, and I'm like, oh, you moved my deodorant, babe. Don't be moving my right guard when I'm in a hurry in the morning. And I'm just, you know, we, we naturally accuse and we come against, because the Bible says, David claims this, that in the Old Testament, that we were born into sin in our mother's womb. And from the get-go, we we're kind of bent toward evil. We we're bent toward sin. Isn't that true? I remember with my boys, I'm like, hey, did you knock this over? No, I didn't do that, Dad. Well, who else knocked it over? You're the only person in the room, you know? And we, we come against this, but sometimes the accusing of one another it hurts, doesn't it? It happens in marriage. It's like, this is never going to work out. Maybe we got married too earlier. Or it's your fault that he's acting this way. Or how come he can't pay the bills? Or 
All we do is argue. I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to be with you. And I, right? We see this in counseling and people are struggling and they're hurting. Or the depression is hurting. You see people and they walk in this place. They come in and they're like, hey, how you doing? Good to see you, brother. And you know how it goes here. There's like handshake and central going on, like everywhere, you know, and it's great, but you walk in, but you don't know what came from the car. Maybe a huge fight. Why do we even bother going to church? All we do is argue, you're fake anyhow. Or this isn't, you know, this isn't going to work out, right? Then we come in and we shake hands like everything's great. And our pain and our sin is coming against us and it's hurting us. It's bringing us to a spot, man, that we can't even take. It's brought her to this spot today. It's brought us maybe to this spot today where the law that we can't keep throws us out. People accusing left and right that we can't fight back. Can you notice that she doesn't say anywhere in the scripture that I'm not guilty, I didn't do it, I plead not guilty. She didn't say anything because she knew her shame. She knew her guilt. She knew her sin had brought her here. She knew it, and she was helpless and hopeless and didn't know what to do, and these men are coming against her. By the way, ladies, where, where's the guy in this situation? Dude, they didn't even care. They didn't even care. The enemy doesn't even care that he destroys your life. That's why he's described as a lion, trying to roaring around who he can seek and kill and destroy he don't care about you. He cares about defaming Jesus, do you see? And it's right there. She's right in the middle here. She's not pleading not guilty, just like we don't sometimes. If we really get honest, we're like, you know what? I get it. I know my struggles. I know where I fall short. Man, and I don't, I don't want to. Nobody sets out to fail. Nobody sets out just to say, I'm just going to do this and fail. No. And we set out with great hopes, and we crash, and we burn sometimes, and it hurts and the church, the one place. You see these people? They almost represent a church in a way where they're, they're throwing them out and they're, and they're putting her right here in the center, of, right in front of Jesus and everyone being taught. And they're like, what about this person? Man, Jesus is about to say, I'm going to show you, what about it? What if prostitutes come in our church? Huh? What if drug dealers come in our church? What if people that are abusive and this and that come in our church? Why should they come anywhere else? Is there any hope anywhere else for them, by the way? No. Here is a place of hope. Here is a place of help. This is the church of Jesus, and let me show you what he does. Verses 7 through 9. And as they continue to ask him, they're, they're asking, the enemy is taunting, and the law is trying to come against him, and he's saying, and as they continue to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, look at this, let him who is without sin among you be the first to cast the first stone. Do it. Like, I'll, I'll make a mound, fellas. Grab the stones and cast away, because you know what? She did sin, and, and, and she did do this, and I get it, and I've come not to like get rid of the law. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law and what the prophets have said, right? That's what I've come to do. And he's saying, so go ahead. If you guys don't have any sin, by all means, cast a stone. By all means, persecutor. Why do we do that as a church sometimes? People come in and we're like, oh, they got problems. Or they got issues. Good, so do we. Come in because we all need Jesus, don't you think? He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that's going to start a good work in your life. Man, a work to rebuild you, redeem you, change you, make you into something incredible. Because again, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And he that starts a good work, tell me, church, is he faithful to complete that work in you? If we put our focus on him, yes, 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 emphatically yes. He can do this. And he's telling these people, you don't got the right to judge. He's saying, you, you don't not have sin. You're not the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. You're not the, right, from the beginning of time that I've been dreaming about this people, that I've been loving them and caring. You're not, not going to die for her on the cross, are you, is what he's saying. You're not going to do any of that stuff. Jesus is standing right up in the middle of a storm in her life. Do you see this? He stands right up, and he puts one powerful arm to the left, just like with Moses in the Red Sea. He begins to make a way and a path. You see Jesus through the whole Bible, and even with Moses, as he lifted the staff, representing Christ in her life, being at the center, that it pushed a mighty sea back, that for this woman on that day, like it could for us on this day, in the days to come, that it pushes the pain back, the depression back, the hurt back, the guilt back, the sin back. It puts it up, a broken marriage it can set to the, it can do all these things and his mighty right hand separates here and he stands in the middle. He says, who has the right to judge is what he's asking. And he says, none of you do. And the old men, from the oldest to the youngest, begin to walk away because they know their sin. They know their guilt. They know they're not qualified to judge. But he is. And he stands in the midst of this lady free from the sin and the guilt that honestly she deserved that we deserve. But he says, I'm here to judge with something different. 
He didn't come to bring condemnation in the world. We are already condemned. Do you see this? Before Jesus, we stand here condemned. With Jesus, we stand here holy and righteous before God. Because of what we did? No, because of what he did on the cross. Do you see this? It's grace and truth. John opens up in chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Moses brought the law that he couldn't handle. I mean, the guy came down the mountain and broke it right away. He couldn't handle the law. I mean, we can't handle the law. We can't keep it. But Jesus says, I'm coming with grace, unmerited favor, goodness, righteousness, peace, right? Oh, man, he comes with this stuff for us, and he puts it on. He says, put your sin on me. I'll carry it, and I'll bury it in the ground, and I'll kill it because he overcame death, hell, and the grave, and he'll raise again with new life, and my new life that I raise with because I've destroyed the sin and the old man, I'll give to you. I'll make you a new creature in Christ, a new creation, a new beginning. I'll make you perfect and spotless in front of God again. Does that mean in this world everything's perfect? No, but we know in standing with God, we now have God on our side and not against us anymore. When he stands there, can you imagine? John knew this, just like with the disciples. They saw this man, Jesus, heal the blind, give the blind sight, They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw him do these incredible things. But the greatest thing that he ever did was to go to a cross and cross us over from being dead in our sin, dead in our trespasses. And he brings us over from what he did on the cross into having new life from what nobody could pull us from the grips of hell and the grave. Jesus, with his powerful hands full of love and mercy, picks us up and sets us over. And on that day with that woman, he says, I'm going to judge, but I'm going to judge you with mercy and with righteousness and with humility. I'm going to help you. Do you deserve death? Do you deserve pain? Yes, but Jesus says, I'm going to trade your place I will take care of this. Do you see this today? Do you see what takes place? And John gives us a window into this world of what Jesus is doing, of what he wants to do in his church, what he wants to do with us. He's forgiven us of a debt that we can never repay. He loves us with a love that is everlasting. It's boundless. Nothing can stop it. And he tells her, it goes on, verses 8 and 9. And once more he bent down and he began to write, and they heard it. And they went away one by one. Go to verse 9. I'll back up, sorry. And Jesus was left alone, standing with a woman. Look what he says in verses 10 through 11. Jesus stood up. Are you not glad that Jesus stands up for you, by the way? Man, Jesus stands up for you, stands up for me, stands up for everybody out there. He's willing and he is powerful and able to stand up for us. It says, women, where are they? Taskers, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? She said, no. No. Can you manage the astonishment? No one, God. No one's condemned you. No, no, yeah. I, I don't get it. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from on, sin no more. Go and leave this place and become a new creature in Christ. Go and leave this way. I'll take your pain. I'll take your guilt. And you go out and you become a new creature, a new creation in Christ, right? Isn't this incredible that Jesus gives us a second chance? Jesus takes our wrongs and he makes them right. He takes what was upside down and puts it backside up. Do you see this in your life? Whatever is going on today, Jesus can stand right in the middle of your life. And if you just look to him and humble yourself to him, he'll say, I'll help you. I'll help you. He can do this. It's his church and he loves it. It's you and me, and he loves us. You know, it's incredible what God, in Psalms, he says he takes our sin and he removes it as far as from the east is from the what? West. Man, he removes it. In Isaiah, the Bible prophesies and says that God was this God that said, I, even I, have not only removed your sins, I don't even remember them anymore. I've gotten rid of them. I'm thrown into the deepest sea. Nobody's going to remember them or hold them against you anymore. It doesn't matter what you've messed up in or, or, or goofed up, and it doesn't matter at all that Jesus has come to make us white as snow again. How is that possible? Through love and through grace and through mercy for you. Why? To give you a new purpose in life. What? To be the church, to shine Jesus, to share his light for others that are hurt and dying out there that need Jesus so badly. And who spreads the message? He says it, his church, his church, it's us, it's us. Man, we don't have to give condemnation anymore to people. We can give them life, we can give them hope, we can give them peace, we can give them purpose. Why? Because they need it as bad as we needed it. Are you there? 
Man, they needed this grace as much as we need this grace. They need to live by grace as much as we need to live by grace. There's an incredible story as we wrap up that if you had been where you have no newspaper or maybe no internet or no TV or you've been in a cave pretty much for the past week, you would have missed this. But I doubt anybody has. Everybody in the room has seen this. That this big event that's gone on for just under 120 years, the Boston Marathon, Oh, what an incredible thing. In 1996 or 7, it was the biggest attended marathon in the world. In this race, thousands, like 27,000 runners come to run this race. They come to, and they have to do other marathons to qualify for this race. We have good friends, Andy and Anita, that go to this church that, that are runners all the time. I, I try to keep up with them sometimes, and I just, like, have a heart attack. and can't even do it. And they just run this race, you know, and they're, they're running this race, and all of a sudden, Andy is there, and he's posting on Facebook, her husband. He's here with his two boys, Austin and Alec. And he's with these two boys, and, he, and he's sitting there, and he's saying, man, he's saying, it's so incredible. Anita's doing great. She's running seven minutes and 20 seconds, seven minutes and 30 seconds, seven minutes and, you know, 40 seconds. She's keeping a steady pace for 26.2 miles, and she's just so excited about this. And, man, she finishes, you know, through the finish line. And probably moments later, as everybody knows, it not just shook a place in Boston and shook their life as a family and shook the world around us. Explosion goes off and another one goes off too. And the people are scattered and they're hurt and they're crying and they're upset and they're confused and they're looking for safety. They're looking for a safe place to go. And Anita begins to write this article as Oakland Press took it down. She said, I was so scared for my babies, for Austin and for Alec. And I wanted to know where they were and my husband Andy and Andy and Austin and Alec are looking for her too and they're scrambling. Can you imagine just for a moment you're in this place and you're crying out, where are you? And they're crying back, we're over here, here. And Austin stands up. Austin stands up over there and he cries out, mom. He goes, I see you. I'm over here. Mom, come this way. Mom, come over here. And he sees her blue running coat and she begins to run to him and they embrace and they're there and they reconnect the family. And I learned something this week. Austin, will you stand up for me, buddy? Austin's a 13-year-old young man. Stay up for just a moment, buddy. 13 years old, and he knew this, that it didn't matter what his mom had ever done, any sin she'd ever committed, anything that ever went wrong or sideways or anything at all. All he cared about at that moment in time was that, Mom, there's your blue coat. Mom, come to safety. Mom, what an incredible young man. That if an incredible young man, an incredible young man, knew this, a 13-year-old middle school boy knew this, that when people are hurt and broken and they're nervous and they're upset and they're afraid and there's nothing they can do about it, yell for them for safety. Can I preach this for a moment as we close? That Jesus stands in the middle of your life today. He stands in the midst of his church and he says, come on, church. Come to me, all you that are heavy laden with burden. Come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me and I'll give you salvation. Come to me and I'll give you hope. Come to me, I will stand in the midst. I will take your sin and make you righteous. I'll take what's wrong and make it right. I'll take what the enemy means for bad. I will make it good in your life. Come on, church. That's the Jesus that we serve, that we love, that gives us hope. This is Christ. This is the Christ. And Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. He has started a good work in your life, maybe for some of you today, and he is faithful to finish it. And we have but one thing we do. We put our focus and we put our eyes on Jesus, and we watch him transform our life. And then all of a sudden, from there, we become the church that we're called to become glorious upon a city on a hill that people see and they come to. And when they come in our doors, they come in our small groups, they come to the programs, they pull in the parking lot, they ask you at your home, why do you go to church here? You hold an arm out as Jesus held to you. And you say, come, come and find out the hope that is in this Jesus. Find the forgiveness that fuels my heart. Find the redemption that I could never do in my own life. Find a marriage that can be made whole, a family put back together. Depression held at the bay. This is Jesus. He is mighty and powerful, but he is full of grace and truth and hope for me and for you. For me and for you. We stand with me today for a moment. I'm so excited, as you can tell, about Jesus and who he is in our life and what he's done for us. He is incredible. As Brandon becomes to play, there's an incredible song about Jesus. As they begin to play this, I want to encourage you, I want to pray for you, that some of you may have came in this place today 
and your hope has been flattened a little bit. You feel a little bit deflated in life. You feel like, man, I need God for me because I feel like everything else is against me. Can I tell you this place today that when Jesus is for you, man, he is for you that nothing can come against you. When God is for you, nothing can come against you. And it's so simple, but it's to say, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, this is your church and I'm part of it. And God, I want you in my life, right? Jesus, be the author and finisher of my faith. Start a good work in me, Jesus, and complete it. I need you. Are we there, church, today? That's where we need to be. That's where we need to be. Let me pray with you for a moment. We're going to worship. Father, I love you. God, I pray that in this place today, God, that you do something great in here in their life, that you maybe started a fire and ignited something in their soul, Jesus. Man, you are so great. Your name, there is no other name under heaven which we might be saved by, live through, dream with. Jesus, Jesus, you're incredible. Let us worship as your church, as the altar is open. Let people come if they want to come. Pray in their seat. Man, pray up here. We'll pray with them. Jesus, we want to introduce people to you. They need you. God, we love you. Love us this morning the way you do. In your name.